Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yo, yo, Daph, what's going on? What's going on? Nothing, man. Just out here living my best life, you know? <laughs> living my best life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I actually, I just went skydiving. What? I mean, it was indoor skydiving. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to see how you was going to react to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was it was still it was fun though but it was it was a lot more difficult than i thought it was gonna be it it was yeah, yeah i actually got- fell out of the sky <laughs> oh, i hurt myself like I, I fell and hit the net so oh like, my god <laughs> you gotta be careful with them things i see they got one down the street for me i've been always debating of whether or not i'm going to try it or not those little indoor wind tunnels and stuff yeah you like you need some real core strength because like you have to like stay in like this position like you have to keep your spine very straight and the wind is blowing so hard that it's just kind of like I feel like my neck I feel like I tumbled in there because my natural reaction was like I'm tired of like holding my spine straight as this wind is blowing against me so yeah (laughs) oh my god I'm about to try it one day one day um but anything else been going on besides your your skydiving adventures nothing just oh my goodness like i said just just still traveling um i'm in chicago right now headed to new york i'll be home for a couple days and headed to boston home for a couple days then headed to tennessee it's just like too crazy too crazy so i'm just trying to keep up with myself what about you (laughs) <laughs> oh man um yeah no, and you know still the busy just like like i said this semester is probably gonna be my busiest semester ever and so i've just been trying to keep up pace with it you know just trying to stay organized stay on top of things because <laughs> i know as soon as i take my gas my foot off that gas pedal all of a sudden probably you could be overwhelmed you know one of those mm-hmm. semesters where you just feel like it's collapsing so i was like no let me stay on top make sure i'm grading everything on time staying on top of my lessons plans and just trying to be real organized <laughs> did you actually assign like a lot of papers? Like, did you plan the grading out to where it wouldn't be like craziness? Yeah, when I have, so when I teach all my classes, I make sure to like never have like all my classes have papers due at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I space it out like, you know, probably like one class a week and it gives me time and space to focus on those papers before, you know. Cause I don't never understand when professors like are like, oh my God, I have all the all papers due all this week. I'm like, you can create your syllabus, you know, <laughs> if you plan it out carefully, you can make sure that that doesn't happen. So I'm always careful with that because that that just would be crazy I'm trying to do like a hundred some odd papers at the same time. No way. Um, but yeah, that, that's been about it. And you know, I was thinking too the other day. I was like. You know, shout out, shout out to us. You know, this was about this time last year when I kind of first reached out to you about doing the podcast about a year ago, even though we didn't start until like February. But it was like I pitched the idea to you like last September, maybe early October around this time. And- yeah. And I mean, I'm happy because we took time to like develop an, an, an idea mm-hmm. and we have been able to consistently release an episode since we launched. So I, bravo, and thanks for reaching out. Thanks for thinking about me. I I, I feel happy to be a part of the BHD family. (laughs) Just ordered ordered my BHD t-shirt and hoodie. Yes, yes, make sure y'all do that, okay? Campaign T's for degrees. Join BHD as we get ready to give back with our first ever donated campaign called T's for Degrees. Where 100%, yes, 100% of the proceeds will be donated to the United Negro College Fund. All you have to do is go to our website at www.blackandhollydangerous.com, click the link that says Tees for Degrees, and purchase a Black and Holly Dangerous t shirt or hoodie. Hurry now because this is only a 20 day campaign. So get your orders in now. When you get your t shirt, use the hashtag Tees for Degrees and tag us on social media, and you can get featured on our website. Remember, your purchase goes towards helping students of color get scholarships for college. So help BHD spread the word with hashtag T's for degrees. 
get y'all t-shirts, get y'all hoodies. A lot of people actually um, have been saying they like the hoodies, you know? Yeah, they're <laughs> really nice. I can't wait for mine to come. I got one for me and John, you know? Nice. Yep, yep. Order mine too. So everybody keep ordering them and, and it's for a good cause. Again, going to the United Negro College Fund. Um, so make sure you order yours. And what the funny thing about that is, just a quick interesting tidbit is that when I was like I'm trying to put the ad out on Facebook and all these other websites, they would not. They had to like review it <laughs> because I was said that for I was saying the proceeds are going to United Negro College Fund, and I guess because of the word Negro, they were like, oh, they were like red flagging it as an ad. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Negro, did you know that Negro was actually on the census up until like 2000 or something like that, or 1999, like? Oh man, see. Like, yeah. So come on now. Come on. <laughs> let us let us do our charity work. Facebook. I ain't no red flag. <laughs> but all right, we got some uh old Lord news coming up. Yes, we do. All right, let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye-opening old Lord news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say So uh, last week we talked about um, the murder um, of uh, Botham Jean in Dallas by a police officer in his apartment, right? You remember mm-hmm. the story? Okay, so I just kind of want to follow up on that because, you know, this investigation is, oh Lord, newsworthy. Mm-hmm. So um, they did begin an investigation into his death. Um, however, instead of looking into the actions of the cop, who shot him in his own apartment, Dallas police actually used her version of what happened to execute a search warrant in his apartment. And the search warrant warrant from the very beginning said, you know, they were looking for like, you know, ballistics and blood, which you would expect to find. But guess what? They were also going to be looking for narcotics. Mm -hmm. And not surprising, as soon as I read that search warrant, um, I was like, "Mm, they looking for narcotics. How much you want to bet they're going to find something? Mm -hmm. And come to find out on Thursday, the morning of his funeral, the unsealed uh, affidavit about what they found was released. And Fox News released a story letting the public know that the police found 10 grams of weed in a Ziploc bag on the counter in his apartment. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. Now, this this really, really bothered everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, not even just his family, it bothered everybody because we talked about this last week, how, you know, his image was so squeaky clean that they really couldn't say anything. And then you're looking for stuff to like potentially try to assassinate his character or make it seem like somehow the murder was his fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No. And I mean, just to put this in perspective at like 52% of Americans over 18 have tried weed Mm -hmm. and upwards of like 44% of those people who tried it still smoke it. And that's just like a little random poll that I found, like Yahoo News. It was like 2017. The numbers might even be higher. You know, and it, to me, it was crazy because when you have people like right wingers, like the NRA um, spokesperson, Dana, I can't, Dana Loesch or something like that. And like, a couple of other just very right wing finger figures. When you have them like, what does this have to do with anything? Like when they are publicly coming out to say this, you know, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, no, they, they are really wrong. They are super wrong. I mean, this is disgusting. Um, you know, the guy wh- who does this, a victim, right, of a murder, of a homicide is the one getting their apartment searched. And, and then, you know, the media, Fox News, of course, spewing this nonsense of, oh, he had weed on him. What, what does that have to do with anything? 
you know, it has absolutely nothing to do with anything. And y'all just trying to find a reason to, to put a blemish, to tarnish this guy's reputation or in the way he's perceived in the media to try to justify what this police officer did. And even talking about the week, that's our article just the other day talking about how the elderly are increasingly, increasingly smoking more marijuana. Right. I saw that too. I saw that too. So everyone, everyone do, is doing. This is why they're trying to change the laws, and it's just, it's just, come on, it's just not that serious. And looking deep, more deeply into the story, I've seen that you know the part of it was saying that well, her his neighbors have been saying that they've heard the police officer banging on the door, asking him to open it, which is going mm-hmm. against what she, what she had completely said. Mm-hmm. Um, And they were saying that, and we'll see how true this is or not, but they're saying that she had an issue with him for a while because uh, he liked to play music loud and that, and she would, you know, complain about it and it would really annoy him. And, and, and and Kristen and I, a couple of years ago, we lived in an apartment, a new apartment complex like that with, with key fobs and all that kind of stuff. And when I tell you that we had a neighbor that lived above the, above us, that was just terrible when it came to noise and like just the banging and all that kind of stuff. So it happens. And I can see that being a very believable story that she was just really frustrated after a 16 hour work day. And that she was trying to go up there and confront him. Right. Mm-hmm. And now, and now all of a sudden she's changing the story. Like, like, Oh, you know, I didn't know what, what I was at. You knew where you was at. <laughs> you knew exactly I, what you were doing. I, I really hope that investigators check to see whether she used her fob in her door before mm-hmm. she went up to his apartment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That would I would be interested to say that. And in addition to like you mentioned, like how she had a problem with him, it's actually reported that she had filed a complaint actually that morning because he was making noise before she went to work. Mm, so she was already mad. So she yeah, was, she was mad. Like my my theory is that she was pissed. She was frustrated, mm-hmm. and you know she decided that. I, you know, I, I can't say whether she, like, oh, she went up there to kill him, but like maybe she did not like his reaction, mm-hmm. you know, and then mm-hmm. she decided to, you know, further take matters in her own hand. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we'll see, because I think, you know, it's interesting that they're saying this is a, a manslaughter charge where it should be the second degree. Uh, yeah. Because the victim did not provoke, you know, uh, the perpetrator at all. Uh, which is usually what happens with manslaughter is that the victim played a role in it. Maybe they pushed it, maybe they argued, but if this guy was just home and she came to his door, that's that's second degree. You yeah. Know? yeah. So. And I, I really hope they don't overcharge purposely mm-hmm. so that she's found not guilty. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. second degree with lesser charges being possible would mm-hmm. be perfect. Yeah, it should definitely be second degree if it's found that she was didn't like the guy or was already upset already, like had these kind of preconceived feelings about him. Mm-hmm. But we'll see. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, a little quick old law news in political news. Mm-hmm. Um, you heard Paul Manafort uh, is cooperating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He pled guilty to money related crimes prior to the Trump administration, but I'm sorry, young Mueller, I'm going to call him Young Mueller. Uh, He's out. And hopefully this leads to um, something related to Trump. I'm crossing my fingers. (laughs) Yeah, they are saying that Trump should be very worried, you know, but this is not the first time they said this. And I don't know, man. This guy Trump is like, like, you just impenetrable, man. Like, no matter what. (laughs) And And I feel like if it was any other president that had all these accusations or issues or, or controversies, I mean, they would be gone. It would be a wrap. But for some reason, this guy could just do and say whatever. And I've seen this list of like, um, through these investigations, they have like, I, I forgot it was on social media somewhere, but they went through like this long list of everybody who's been like caught up, pled guilty, indicted while under Trump. You know, it was like a long list, man. I'm like, all these people get caught up in all these controversies and these wrongdoings and and nothing has happened to Trump yet. It's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure there are more to come. Um, mm-hmm. Second little piece of small, oh, Lord, uh, political news is I just read that uh, Michael Bloomberg might be running for president. What? <laughs> That's crazy. I didn't see that one. Yeah, like it was just it was a story that was just released. He didn't say it, but it was sources closest to him. You know, I don't know how I feel about that because I just know it seemed like New Yorkers were just 
really split on him, but he seemed like a a, a Democratic version of Trump. I, I don't know. So I don't I don't know. Yes. Yeah. See, that's what I'm saying. Even like I just heard uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Oscar De La Hoya talking about he went though. He thinking about throwing his hat in the ring for president. Uh, the, the boxer and Golden Boy promotions. I'm like, boy, you crazy, man. <laughs> Lord, Trump done gave all of these people presidential well, dreams. Can. Anybody can be president. Mm-hmm. We need to get back to you know people that know what they're doing, man. It's no more celebrity in chiefs, as as Charlemagne likes to say. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so our our last story will actually is a nice segue into today's topic about race and multiracial identity. Okay, so um, you know DNA. Uh, testing has become very popular. Ancestry.com, 23andMe, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, people often use these tests because they want to get back to their roots. They want to know who they are. And I know Black people is especially a popular among Black people uh, from the United States or born in the United States because they want to know who they are. Well, one Washington man received his DNA results and decided that it was time for reparations. A man named Ralph Taylor, whose recent DNA results came back as 90% European, 6% Indigenous American, and 4% Sub-Saharan African, is suing Washington State and the federal government because he was denied a minority business certification under a program created two decades ago um, for minorities. (laughs) (laughs) What? Come on now. Yes. So through his attorney, um, Taylor claimed that he was black because of the one drop rule. So because of that 4% that he found oh, out he had, no. he's invoking the one drop rule. No. Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> he, he went so far as to change his birth certificate. Of course, you know, he's been living as a white person for 55 or 52 years or something like that. His birth certificate said Caucasian at birth. He changed it to say Black, Native American, and Caucasian. And when questioned about, like, his so-called Blackness, he told, uh, he told like, uh, the certification people that he has uh, an Ebony Magazine subscription and is also a member of the NAACP. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yo. This is crazy, man. I, you, you know, I just, I, there's no words for this. I mean, now people are using a one-drop rule to their benefit. This is insane. I don't, I don't even know what to think about this. And the yeah. fact that you're going to say because I have an Ebony subscription... You know, I'm black. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So last year, uh, a judge actually dismissed the case and was like, you know, the intent of the federal program was to combat racism. You know, you haven't been impacted by racism, you know, because yeah, yeah, white and you look white. Yeah. Um, but his lawyers is taking it to the court of appeals, and they will hear it later this year, early next year. And I have a feeling that even if they lose the appeal, they might try to take that thing to the Supreme Court. Because his goal is he he feels like they're not there should not be a program for minorities. That if there is a special government program, it should be for people with economic hardship and not minorities. But this was created because of racism and not because of classism or mm-hmm. I don't know, but it's crazy. Yeah, no, that's crazy. Yeah, he's he seems like he's gonna push it all away. Um, but you can't do that, man. You you've identified, you know, as white your whole life and your your DNA results showed the same thing. And now all of a sudden, because you couldn't get a particular loan or some kind of benefits, now you want to try to complicate the system and problematize it for, you know, real genuine problems that we have in this country. So hopefully, you know, this is something to watch because if this gets through, then you can be, bet your bottom dollar so many people are going to try, you know, with these DNA tests. And, oh, I'm 1%, you know, sub-Saharan African. You know, now I should be able to qualify. No, I don't think I don't think that should be allowed. Um, yeah. Con- considering the fact that the average African American has about 20 to 25 percent European blood. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. We don't just all of a sudden get to call ourselves white. Nope. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So like 
Stop it. <laughs> yes. Yes, we do not get them benefits of white privilege at all. <laughs> y'all be interested. I'm going to take that test one day and I'll share it with y'all whenever I do. Because I've been thinking about that. I just want to see what, what my results will be. <laughs> and if you do, make sure after you get your results, you go back in and say that you do not want your results or DNA used for like scientific testing oh. or like because they, they have started using that for like pharmaceutical testing. Academic researchers are actually using it now to like kind of study like race and like it's changing dynamics. So once you get it, make sure you go back in and, you know. Yeah, and take my name out that hat. Yeah. Because <laughs> who knows what they could be doing. Oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of scary. Yeah, I, I might wait a little bit now. <laughs> I, know, I know I'm black enough, so I'll just... <laughs> Uh, but speaking of race uh today we are going to focus on um just understanding and talking about like uh, research related to uh biracial and multiracial identity mm-hmm, mm-hmm. today we have dr sarah gaithers coming on an assistant professor of psychology and neuroscience at duke university um this is a really cool interview uh, because we really wanted to have a conversation about biracial biracial identities for a while and she agreed to come on and her expertise is in biracial and social identities interracial interactions and racial categories categorizations and all that good stuff um her research focuses on this, but she also, you know, has a unique perspective because she's also a biracial person um, mm-hmm. and, and has uh, ha- half black and half white. And so has traversed and, and navigated this world of being biracial. And so her experiences also, you know, led her to lead to this particular research agenda where she's found some really valuable and interesting things that we'll talk about in our interview as well. And so it was cool too. And we also asked her about things you'll see about not just from a research perspective, but from personal perspectives too. Uh, people, you know, identifying as biracial, how to, you know, raise children that are biracial and getting some advice on those things because some of her research does focus on biracial children as well. So for all of those of you who might be in biracial relationships and stuff like that, and maybe want to just gain a little more knowledge on raising children or rearing children, or understanding some of what they go through as far as identifying, this would be a great interview to listen to and also check out some of her work. Um, so yeah, before, and, and remember, uh, before we get into the interview, continue to hit us up. If you want to be a guest on a podcast for our current events, we've already had a few listeners hit us up. So we're excited, got them lined up and they'll be joining us, especially on next week's episode. When we cover current events, we'll have our first listener guest on to talk about current events and things that they're interested in. So continue to uh, hit us up with that. And of course, continue to buy the shirts for Tease for the Blues campaign. Only a couple weeks left with that. Other than that, you ready to get into it, Dad? Let's go. All right, catch up with you afterwards. With the increase of interracial relationships in marriage, discussions centered around biracial children and identities have began to gain traction among researchers and policymakers. Today, we seek to gain a better understanding of biracial identity research and experiences with Dr. Sarah Gaithers, an assistant professor of psychology and neuroscience at Duke University. Her research focuses on how intergroup contact shapes interracial interaction outcomes for both racial majority and racial minority individuals. She also looks at how having multiple racial or social identities more broadly affects various types of behavior, including things like complex thinking and social behavior. Today, we welcome Dr. Gaithers. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. We are excited to have you. Um, So we always begin these conversations uh, by asking our guests to tell us a little bit more about themselves. I know that you study uh, your expertise that shows social identity, uh, biracial identity, interracial interactions. And so I'm really interested in learning more about you and what sparked your interest in these topics. Yeah, so I'm pretty much what people call a me-searcher, which I think half of academia says is a bad thing to be because you can't distance yourself from your work enough. So I myself am biracial. I'm part white, part black. My dad's black. My mom's white. But outwardly, if any of you out there Google what I look like, you'll think I look just like any other white person in the world. So I grew up pretty confused in life about who I was. I was raised more by the black side of my family than the white side of my family, um, but outwardly clearly not experiencing the quote-unquote black experience here in the U.S. Um, But I did grow up 
being very aware of the fact that my dad and my mom were clearly treated very differently based on different contexts we were in. And it over time made me really hyper aware of the role that race and the social constructions of race, how it is we view race in our society, impacts how we treat each other on a daily basis. Um, I never thought I'd ever end up a professor or studying these things for a living. Um, but after my undergraduate career, I was a lab manager for a psychology lab at UCLA and ran my very first study ever with biracial three-month-old infants. These infants were actually part white, part Asian, and discovered through that process that no one had been researching the multiracial experience, at least from a psychology lens. For psychology experimental research, I decided this could maybe be my calling in trying to figure out what it is that's unique for the biracial population in the U.S., what things overlap with different monoracial groups in the U.S., and so really, it's just been my life experience kind of coming to the forefront now as faculty here at Duke. Oh, nice. So <clears throat> before we move forward, because a lot of this conversation will be centered around race. Um, and you mentioned just now that race is socially constructed. So for our listeners, so we can all be on the same page. Can you just define race for our listeners and what does it mean that it is a social construct? Yeah, so race and ethnicity are always very tricky terms that are used in lots of different areas of research. And I think there's actually still a lot of debate on how to define these terms. So I will tell you how I think of these terms, but there are probably some of you out there who will disagree with these definitions. Uh, the traditional definition, in my opinion, of what race is, is usually it's linked to biological factors. So sometimes genetics, it usually plays out more with your physical characteristics. So your bone structure, your skin, your hairstyle, eye color. Their physical appearance overall tends to be what we use as determinations of what racial group someone may or may not belong to. Ethnicity, which is also a, a topic that I focus on a lot now in recent work looking at Latino populations, really refers to more cultural factors. So these are more sociological factors, nationality, ancestry, and language. Um, when we say that race is a social construction, what most scholars, I think, would argue that means is we've basically created and defined what it means to be Black in America or what it means to be Asian in America. Whatever the racial group may be, the stereotypes that we have created about these groups' experiences have made race what it is today. Mm, thank you. I, I felt like that was a very good definition for our listeners um, because I've heard people say, like, race is a social construct. It feels so real to me, but... <laughs> That was a good way to put it. Yeah, it's definitely real. And I think the, the other mentality we see a lot in the U.S. right now is this ideology or this outlook known as colorblindness, where some people want to say, well, if race isn't really a real thing, then race shouldn't matter and we shouldn't even consider it. But that's the wrong approach, because although it is socially constructed, we have definitely constructed it pretty sturdily in our society to be a strong predictor of access issues um, and what people in different racial and ethnic groups across society really can aspire to be. So until we get rid of these inequalities, race is a pretty strong construction I think is going to take a while for us to disentangle. Mm, mm, good point. So you mentioned how when you were the lab manager at UCLA, which uh, I have a few friends in my graduate uh, school, they were also like lab managers at UCLA. I feel like UCLA produces a lot of PhD psychology uh, students. Um, but you said that there wasn't a lot of focus in psychology on biracial or multiracial individuals. And so I just, people might ask, why is it important to focus explicit attention on this population? Like, why Why is this important? Yeah, so I think for a lot of people, they don't realize that the mixed race population has existed forever. It's not a new population. We've always been interracial marrying or dating or whatever the case may be. What I think is really unique now is people are more strongly claiming a biracial or a mixed race or a multiracial identity as a category itself. Um, we're seeing that much more often now than um, historically in the past. And so for me, also as a member of the biracial community, if you start looking at all education research, health research, you find that mixed race people have often been excluded entirely from a lot of these findings. So we don't really know what health disparities are actually higher or lower for biracial populations. Uh, for example, my dad being African-American, his whole family is diabetic. We know diabetes is higher prevalency rates within the African-American community. And I have asked probably nine different doctors if I myself being biracial, I'm also at that same prevalency rate or not, and no one can tell me. So it's really this discussion of including people who really straddle these racial and ethnic boundary lines that we know have strong predictors when you're looking at people who 
are more monoracial or monoethnic, um, even though technically I think by now most people in the U.S. society are mixed to a certain extent. Um, so really my big push with what I do in my work is trying to give a voice to the experiences that mixed race people face. They have higher rates of social exclusion than any other racial or ethnic group right now in the United States as well, because they're never black enough, white enough, Asian enough, Latino enough, whatever the case may be. Um, so we really have a long ways to go in understanding how it is they're treated on a daily and basis. Yes. Just quickly, I was wondering, how is your research received, especially because this is a, a new population to focus on? Like, is it well received uh, in the field uh, and more broadly? Yeah, I think it depends. There's been other researchers in other fields. Um, critical mixed race studies research has done um, some incredible groundwork on some of multiracial identity definitions. In my field in social psychology and psychology broadly, I'd say, you know, it's mixed feedback, no pun intended there. Um, some people think that it's a really great addition, a really great acknowledgement of groups who really do kind of go against our singular fixed thinking about identity. We all belong to multiple groups. And I think for me, biracial people are a reminder that we really should be thinking about the intersectionalities of identities that we all have, whether we're mixed race or not. Um, but then there are some other people in the field who really just don't think that calling more attention to race is what we need to be doing in society right now. And that since we lack the theoretical understandings about what it means to be biracial or multiracial, this research can be a really hard sell um, within an academic framework in particular. Interesting. <clears throat> and so like you, you mentioned in your previous response, right, that, you know, biracial individuals are, it's nothing new in this, in this country and in the world. Right. Um, and we've known that, you know, even from like, you know, historical research and stuff like that and conversations about <clears throat> when, uh, you know, the racism was at its peak, it's per se in post-slavery era and stuff like that and mulattoes and those kind of conversations um, that most of the conversation around biracial individuals has been fixed or on the black and white binary. Um, and so your argument, like what you're saying, is trying to, uh, instead of categorizing as one or the other, either or, it's trying to recognize the experiences of those who are both and, and what that means to them. But how did we get to this situation where we only can view people as one or the other and categorize them in that way. Uh, part of it, I think of things like the one drop rule, et cetera. Is that part of how we got here or are there other factors that can contribute to that categorization of just the two? Yeah, I think we've always been for a very long time in a place where we like very fixed, easy thinking about social categories in general. No one likes to think hard about someone else when they meet them for the first time. And we learn through categories. That's how we learn our language. And so when you meet someone who is biracial, this goes against these very easy concepts of what it means to be white, black or Asian or Latino in our society. Um, and so it ends up confusing people to a certain extent. And I think when you're confused, when you're thinking really hard about something, the easiest way for you to get over that confusion is to try and resolve it on your own. So one shortcut that a lot of people use as it relates to race is something, as you just mentioned, right, this one drop rule. So if you see one drop of anything that's not white, historically, this one drop rule has been used since slave days and being able to give certain groups more power over others. And I think this one drop rule is still used today in a lot of ways. Um, I'm now faculty in North Carolina, and we are the example for gerrymandering in voting districts here. And I, when I registered to vote here as a biracial person, they also didn't even know what to do with my racial background and wanted to say that I was white mm. based on the fact that I look white. Uh, but knowing how demographics work, I wanted to make sure that they knew there was at least another partial black person around in my voting <laughs> district so that they knew. Um, so I think we just have these default approaches to try and make categorizing as easy as possible and to maintain our status quo. These one drops rules historically came from whites or those who were in high status positions of power in order to maintain their status. Um, and now we do a lot of face categorization research and we're still showing that if I show you a racially ambiguous or racially mixed face, most people are going to be on average more likely to see that face as a minority group member rather than a white person. 
I was actually uh, uh, just about to get to that. So I uh, reviewed one of your articles uh, where it talks about minority bias in the category uh, categorization of black, uh, white, multiracials. And I was just wondering if, you know, I guess you could expound on that a little bit more. Uh, one thing that I found interesting is, is it seems like you looked at when people were given like just like more discrete options such as black and white versus when they were given like more uh, expansive or like flexible options to define identity. Like how do people view uh, black, white, biracials when they're given more options versus when it's uh, more discreet? Yeah. So the minority bias categorization paper is kind of a follow up to a pretty big area of psychology research that's been looking at how it is we see racially mixed faces. So if I show you a face and you kind of can't tell what race they are, the standard procedure would be to ask participants to categorize them as either white or black as quickly as possible using this forced choice dichotomous task, as we call it in psychology resource uh, research. Um, and what you find overall is that people tend to categorize black, white biracial faces at least more often as black than as white. Um, but we did in this paper, and this was in collaborations with Jackie Chen, who's at University of Utah, um, was we actually made this response option a little more open, a little more varied. So when you give people the option to think a little more about the racial categories that are available to them, you remind them there are other racial groups around, you actually don't find that they only think this mixed race face is a black person. They use other categories such as Latinx, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and it really depends on the person, it depends on their mood, it can depend on the context. And so what we're trying to argue in this paper is that going forward, we're not sure we actually have a complete understanding of always categorizing a mixed person as being black. But what we do see, at least in this set of studies, is we do have a bias to see this person more often as not white. So again, it's still maintaining this high status perception that we've seen since slave lineage days. <clears throat> and so, yeah, even with that, right, we see that in recent years, you know, there's been kind of more of a push. And I think you alluded to this earlier that, you know, there's more than just two races um, and that, you know, even things like the census are allowing individuals to choose more one more than one racial category. Um, so is there anything that led to this movement as far as pushing to the more kind of multiracial aspect of identifying um, any insights, trends related to how biracial individuals in, uh, identify them, define themselves and kind of are there the implications of this movement? Just a, a quick take on that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and even in line with this uh, face categorization research, we also find that if you remind people that biracial is even a category that you can use to describe the space we show you in one of our studies, people will use that category. So it's not like people are afraid of using the word biracial or acknowledging the word biracial. It's just not something that people think of on their own. And so this is actually what led to the Census Bureau actually in the year 2000 was the first time people could mark more than one race on their census forms. And this was largely in part um, as a result of a bunch of lobbying um, efforts by different advocates within the multiracial community who really just wanted a recognition of their identity. They didn't know how to categorize their kids. They didn't know how to categorize themselves. And so through these changing public attitudes over time, eventually they got enough traction to allow this option on the Census Bureau. Now it's still relatively new within census history. So we think that right now we're still getting an underestimate of how many mixed race people are in the United States. But we know the mixed race group based on the census is growing about three times as fast as any other racial or ethnic group right now in the mm. country. That's really interesting. So thinking about um, more about the identity of uh, biracial or multiracial individuals and how they define themselves, um, I was wanting to know a little bit more about your concept of identity flexibility. Like, what is it and... How does it impact the way multiracial and biracial individuals navigate social settings or even political settings? Um, and are there any implications for intergroup relations in terms of like how we all get along? Yeah, we don't all get along all the time. Right. But yeah. Uh, so for identity flexibility, what I mean by that in a lot of my research and the research of others is if you belong to multiple groups, so a biracial person in this case, 
they should be able to more easily turn off and on or code switch or frame switch between these different identities. So in certain contexts, they may naturally feel a little more black. In other contexts, maybe they're going to naturally feel more white. And they also should be able to turn on those behavioral differences, those mannerisms within those contexts as well. So some of the work I've done actually shows that for biracial black white people, if you remind them about their black identity and then ask them to talk to a black person, you're going to have a pretty positive same race interaction. So low anxiety, lots of smiling, you're basically having a really good time. But if I remind a biracial black white person about their white identity and they interact with the same black person, you actually find more typical negative interracial interaction outcomes. So way higher anxiety. They don't even want to talk to the person. They're really anxious about everything that they're saying. So this simple identity switch can impact people's social behavior within the biracial community. And we've also extended this to their language and verbal abilities as well. So it can make them sound more white or sound more black as well, respective to just reminding them through a very simple writing task of one of those racial identities. Mm-hmm. So I, I know I know in a couple of your studies, um, uh, you got you use the term uh, priming, right? So what what exactly does that entail when you're doing these kind of experimental designs? Yeah, so priming is a a fun topic in psychology, and there's actually some replication issues behind priming as well in the field, just for all of you to be aware of. Um, But what we do in our work a lot of the times is ask people to just write for a minute or two about the racial background of either their white parent or their black parent. And just that simple writing reflection task for a minute or two is enough to shift those social behaviors and those verbal behaviors that I mentioned before. Um, It's also easy enough to do this just with a simple demographic form. So a big reason why SATs and GREs and all these standardized tests have actually moved their demographic questions to the end of standardized testing is because just checking a box of what race or what gender you are can also remind you of those identities and impact testing scores. Um, And we've shown these same types of testing effects with biracial people as well, that getting them to think about their black identity you see these typical stereotype threat outcomes, and they actually do worse on a GRE. For reminding of their positively associated white identity, they actually do better on the same exact GRE exam. Wow. So that's some applications of social psych in the real world. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's really um, cool. So, you know, you, you have a, quite a few uh, articles and research findings and stuff like that. Are there any other interesting findings and studies that you would like to discuss with our, with our listeners pertaining to this topic that we may not have asked already? Yeah, so we have some new work. I think a lot of my work so far has focused on these positive aspects of identity flexibility. We've shown that the same identity flexibility increases creativity responses as well. So reminding a mixed race person about their flexible identities also shows that they're more flexible on some problem solving tasks. Um, But now my lab is moving a little bit in the direction of trying to focus on some of the more negative outcomes that stem from being biracial. So I mentioned earlier how they're the highest rates of social exclusion than any other racial or ethnic group right now. So we just finished um, a grant through the Russell Sage Foundation. This was done in collaboration with Diana Sanchez at Rutgers University, looking at identity denial in the lab. So we actually bring biracial people into the lab. They don't know it's because they're biracial, but partway into the study, one of my undergraduate research assistants goes up to these participants and says, you know, you're supposed to be part white to be in this study but they're all part white and part something else. And we're looking at cortisol and the health markers, the health responses to this identity denial that we know mixed race people are facing constantly across their lifespan. And this research is showing that not only do they self-report feeling more stress in this environment, um, but their cortisol levels are also elevated. And we know that higher cortisol outcomes are going to predict worse health outcomes across one's lifespan as well. Um, The other interesting part of this, though, is that for biracial people who actually feel strongly identified enough with that group, if they reaffirm that identity, if they say, you know what, I am white, or I do have a white mom, or I do have a black dad, or whatever the case may be, that reaffirmation seems to be serving as a a buffer effect to help reduce some of those negative health and stressful outcomes that we're seeing with this population. So I'm really excited about following up this work. So hopefully I can get some more grant money for that. Oh, yeah, that sounds really interesting, especially when you talk about the health implications that can be associated with that. Um, I had another quick follow up question, too, uh, along the lines of identity flexibility. You know, I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about somebody like President Obama, um, you know, who out, you know, outwardly, of course, looks black and says himself that he identified as black, but was in fact biracial. Um, but kind of this identity flexibility concept. Uh, do you think that 
had been had or could have been used while he was in office or to gain office in his political trajectory, you know, being able to kind of navigate and say different types of worlds and, and settings uh, because of his biracial identity. Do you can do you think that served as like a, um, a resource for him? I think it definitely did. I think, uh, you know, former President Barack Obama is a really interesting case. He is biracial. He has books about being biracial. And yet once he started running for office, he sort of turned off that biracial identity, which I think was purposeful to a certain extent. A, as I said before, the average American really can't handle the word biracial in the first place. So if you're running for office, you should be using terms that people know what to do with, not some new term that's going to make them hard to remember when they go to the polls. Um, but we actually ran a study and published it that right before his reelection, whites thought Obama was too black and blacks thought Obama was too white. But after he was reelected, we find this really interesting shift in that then whites thought he was really white and blacks thought he was really black. So oh, you wow. find this. This in-group claiming, right? When someone from your team wins, so any of you who are sports fans out there, when your team wins, you claim that team hard the next day at work. But when your team loses, you tend to distance yourself a bit, right? And so that's exactly what we saw with former President Barack Obama and that he, because of his flexible identity, at least at this perceived societal level, really could be claimed more easily by a broader population than our typical white male president we've had historically in this country. Um, did he use it purposefully during his presidency? I think he did to a certain extent. You can see evidence of him code switching when he's at black churches, for example, versus when he's in more white political spaces. And I do think he was able to communicate more effectively across these diverse lines, which is exactly what my research would argue. That's that's really interesting and funny how people had the different perceptions and then want to claim the home team. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's this ambiguous group member, right? If there's one drop of something you're not sure is like you, you're going to be more likely to push that person away from your group than to claim them as one of your own. So yeah. I also have to say, before I get to the next question, I, just, I love psychology. I love the methods. Like that is so cool to have someone like walk up because sometimes they call them what Confederates or something yeah. like that. Have somebody exactly. like woke up. yeah <laughs> For those of you listening, I also hate that term now that I'm a researcher in the South in particular. Oh, it's yeah. a, a weird word for me to be using, but Confederates are these fake participants. So they're research assistants on my team who are pretending to be a participant. And that's one way we do a lot of our interracial interaction research. So my lab has 25 undergrads who work in it, um, the majority of which are racial and ethnic minority members. And they basically pretend to be this participants when we bring white students, for example, into the lab. Um, so those are Confederates. But again, I wish social psychology would come up with a new term because I'm not a fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so cool. I should have went into psychology. I, you know what? I say that every time we have, when we interview somebody, like I am so fascinated by what they do. I'm like, I should have chose something else. <laughs> you can always travel in it. The methods are pretty easy to use in lots of places, so... Yeah, yeah. Um, so I over the the last few years, I remember seeing I don't know if it was National Geographic or whether it was a it was a time cover or something, where they had a picture of a multiracial uh woman and you know they talked about how this was the future of the United States. Um and there was an op ed, a New York Times op ed, I think last year, that talked about how the growing multiracial population was the vaccine against the tribalist tendencies roused by Mr. Trump. So I've seen just more narratives about how, you know, we are about to turn into like a, a Brazil or how multiracial individuals will, you know, solve all of our, you know, racial problems or, you know, either, you know, just act as something that can like tame those issues. And I just, I just want to get your thoughts on that argument as like a scholar, you know, you can even answer it from like a personal perspective. Just what are your thoughts on that? Um, especially since you study uh, issues of interracial interaction and diversity. Yeah. So the op-ed you're referring to actually cites uh, some of my own work in that op-ed. Actually, I was interviewed for that op-ed. It was a different angle, to be honest, than what I thought the op-ed was going. And that's the fun of doing things with media, you never quite know what angle our stories are taking. Um, I definitely don't think that multiracial people, as much as that would be an awesome vaccine, are going to be a vaccine against any of the issues we're seeing in our current presidency, political climate, et cetera. Um, it's not their burden, just like it's not any minority person's burden to have to speak up all the time. I think if they were going to be a vaccine, 
they'd have to walk around with shirts saying I'm biracial all the time. Um, Cause oftentimes you don't even know you're talking to someone who's mixed race unless they actually come out and tell you that verbally. Um, and that's the same kinds of burdens that we see within the minority communities, um, particularly within academia, academic spaces. It's always the one minority faculty member who has to speak up about X. Um, and that's tiring for the mixed race population. And um, you sort of have to pick and choose your, your battles. What I do think the biracial community may be doing though, and we have some new work that shows this, is that I think the more we start talking about the mixed race population, the more we start talking about biracial people and this question of identity flexibility, belonging to more groups, I think this is gonna start shifting discussions about race and perhaps getting us to reduce those social constructions, make us realize that maybe you know we all belong to lots of groups and maybe these stereotypes that we apply to people incorrectly all the time are not quite as accurate as we sort of thought they were before. Um, and so we have a new series of six studies, all with white participants that show that if I expose you to multiracial people in the lab, or even your self-report of how many biracial people you know, that exposure tends to reduce those colorblind mentalities I talked about earlier. It makes them more willing to talk about race inequities. It makes them more willing to approach someone discussing a racial issue as well. So that's my only line of hope right now is that maybe this will shift our discussions um, and the willingness that people will have to discuss race in the first place. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, another quick question. Well, how do you feel or your thoughts or your thoughts on um, the idea with the whole conversation what happened like with Rachel Dolezal and stuff like that? And she was saying that she was transracial, <clears throat> although I think she was fully white. Um, how do you what are your thoughts on, on those type of situations? Is that do you feel like that is a legitimate uh, argument or, or or perspective or or not? Yeah, Rachel Dolezal is something that always comes up every time I get interviewed. Um, for me, as a white-looking biracial person who has a biological black father, she's made my life very difficult, to be honest. Um, people equate me to her all the time when I grew up with black people in my family. My dad didn't go to college, right? I, I have experienced things that she has never experienced just by the fact that my parents are a married interracial couple. Um, so I think from a personal angle, she frustrated me a bit. From a psychology angle, from an identity angle, you know, I think she brings up this interesting question of the transgendered movement we're seeing in society right now, although on average, yes, they're not accepted. But I pose this question in my classes here at Duke all the time to my students and say, you know, is it okay to be transracial? Is it okay to be transgender? And almost all of my students will say, oh, yeah, it's fine to be transgender. That's okay. But you can't be trans black. And I always ask them, well, why can't you? They're like, well, you haven't lived the black experience. So how can you be black? And then me sitting there as this white looking biracial professor, I say, well, am I not allowed to claim the fact that my dad is black then? Because I didn't live the black experience either. And so it's this interesting case of the role that race and these physical appearances that we have, knowing that race is a social construction. In theory, people could claim a black identity, I guess. It seems weird. To claim an identity, particularly that's a lower status, because passing has been something we've seen historically over time in our country as well. Usually you're passing to make your life better, right? You're passing as white is the most um, common path that we've seen. Uh, but we've had some new work suggesting that now if you pass in any direction, people don't like you. They think you're not trustworthy. They think you're lying or fibbing of some sort. Um, so I don't think there's enough work out there yet, but Rachel is a very interesting case that I think will spark some new research on what it means to be black or what it means to be transracial um, and the role that physical appearance and biology and experience really have in shaping that cultural identity. Mm, yeah. Interesting. And I think, yeah, cause I think it reminds me, I saw this, um, I'm not sure if you watched, watched the show, familiar with the show Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, I love Atlanta. Uh, on the first season they had that one episode where uh, Paperboy was, you know, on doing some kind of interview. And then they had a guy on there, a black guy who, who was saying that he was white. I think he put like a blonde yeah. wig on and stuff like that. I think it was a really good illustration because it's like the whole transracial conversation, you know, is like, can it work both ways? Is, is I think a part of that. I think what they were trying to get at because it seemed was funny. It was ridiculous. Like, okay, you're clearly black. You can't be white. Your na name can't be, you can change your name to Todd or whatever it is, but how people interact with you, um, is not going to really change because of still how you look uh, while someone like Rachel can, you know, maybe get tanner or change the hairstyles and stuff like that and then be able to pass black. But is there like a, a certain kind of privilege attached to who can actually be transracial and who can't be? 
Right. Yeah. You can't take your skin color off at the end of the day. So if there are minority people who want to be white and a lot of them do aspire to be white, right? We learn this white is good bias in our society really early on in development. Um, and Rachel Dolezal also has used her, I guess, fluid racial identity, if we would call it that, to her own personal advantage and gain, which I don't think the average mixed race person would. So I've never claimed one of my identities more than the other in order to get a job, for example. And she did claim, um, she cited for a discrimination clauses when she was at Howard University, which is HBCU, because she was white. And yet now she's coming out as a strongly black identified person. And so mm -hmm. I think that's another piece of her fluid identity that has rubbed a lot of people in the wrong way, rightfully so. Um, if you're mixed and you really believe that identity, that should be your identity. Um, and so, yeah. So again, she's just a very interesting case and I haven't watched her new Netflix thing, but I guess I should. Yeah, I haven't watched it either. <laughs> yeah, I haven't watched it either. I was going to ask Todd later whether he had watched it. No, I haven't watched yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, I heard her kid, she ended up adopting her black sibling or something like that, I believe. Her kid was not very happy that she made it. So that's really yeah. the, the main feedback I've seen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess in uh, kind of closing out, this is a very different question than kind of what we've asked, but considering your um, own personal experiences uh, as a uh, biracial individual, but also probably things you've have read in psychology about uh, developing like a positive social identity. I was wondering if you had any insight into best practices um, that parents of biracial and multiracial individuals could follow um, to ensure that, you know, their their children are um you know, having positive social identity experiences? Yeah, and I get this question a lot. So in addition to adults, I study three to seven-year-olds for a lot of my research as well, because it's across the ages of three to seven when race and ethnicity start becoming pretty important to kids. Um, and so parents of mixed race kids, they bring them into our lab and ask me that question all the time. And I'm not here to give parenting advice, but the one thing I do always tell most families when they come in is to just let your kid identify how they want to identify what you find is that for kids who feel forced into choosing one of their identities over the other, or they feel forced to only identify as X and not Y by one parent, by friends in their classroom, society, whatever the case may be, that forced experience is what leads to some of these higher rates of mental health outcomes that we see within the mixed race community. Um, so really making sure your kid is positively exposed to all of their identities, let them figure out who it is they are, how it is they are, what it is they want to claim or not claim. Um, and I think that's a really difficult task for parents because, of course, if you're in an interracial relationship with a white person, a minority person, the minority parent tends to be the one that socializes based on discrimination experiences that kid may face. Um, but the one thing I think we don't have enough research on yet is how do we prepare mixed race kids for the unique types of discrimination that they're going to face, right? If they don't really look black, they don't really look white, they look in the middle, they really do get this confused experience all the time from the average person they meet on the street. And for parents who aren't mixed themselves, raising a mixed kid, they weren't socialized growing up on those types of discrimination experiences. So it's a really unique um, question that I don't think we have enough data on. I myself, my parents are still married today. They did a really good job, I think, in making sure all my toys were reflective of all of my backgrounds, even threw in some Native American in there as well, um, to make sure that I knew that I was lots of different things, that I wasn't just this one box. I could play with what I wanted, talk to who I wanted. Um, and I think because of that, I'm much more accepting and open. Uh, people joke and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm black, too. And I say, oh, cool. That's great. They're like, no, I'm not black. How could you think I'm black? I'm like, oh, I just assume everyone's anything that they say now. So maybe I'm too accepting because of this upbringing, but um, that's the biggest piece of advice is really just to let people choose what it is they actually want to identify as. Mm. Yeah, that's real. Cause I have, you know, <laughs> friends and my family, my brothers, um, my brother's in interracial marriage. My other brother, his girlfriend is also not black. And, you know, I, my godson is, is black and white. And so it's very common. I'm surrounded, you know, I, I married a black woman, but I'm surrounded by, you know, a lot of interracial relationships. And I have these conversations a lot of the times with them, right? Um, kind of along with what you said, like, you know, with them having, I ask questions about like what, are your plans or how do you kind of 
navigate or plan to navigate with you when you're children, when you have children and they are also biracial because, you know, my brother is black and his wife is white and, you know, they have their own unique experiences and understand it individually, but they don't, they won't fully understand of like what it's like to be biracial and live in both those and, and have both of those worlds within one um, and that kind of stuff. And then even me just like, okay, well, when they have kids as well and I have kids, you know, my kids are going to be fully black and I'm going to be raising them through that perspective and, you know, not having to really worry about it. But then of course they'll play with their cousins or their cousins will be over. And it's like, how do I, you know, do I just continue to identify or treat them and, speak to as I would with my children who are black or is there certain things I should consider when they're around as well and be more sensitive of, you know, it's like, I really don't know. Um, so this is, and like you said, there's not a lot of research or data really going on about this as much as we need to. So hopefully I'll definitely be paying more attention, you know, as time goes on, as far as what's out there and, and how to navigate these certain situations, because, you know, in my near future, I think I'll be having these kind of <laughs> interactions and, and, and trying to be curious as far as I don't, you know, I don't want to mess it up. I don't want my, my, my nieces or nephews and my godson to feel any kind of way. Um, but I also, you know, my kids are going to, I have to make sure that they understand what it's like to be a black person being raised in this country too. And so it's just like, you know, just things and the thoughts that I have trying to figure yeah, all no, this out. I mean, a, a lot of it's based on what they look like too. Right. So I have yeah. a younger brother who's two and a half years younger than I am. And he looks much more mixed than I do. He's pulled over for driving while black. He's been jumped. I mean, he's had more closely a black experience if you want to call it that. And my dad had to socialize him much more than they ever had to socialize me looking as white as I am. I got socialized for being a woman, right. And things you should and should not do as being a woman in society. But my brother got all kinds of extra attention. And I remember I was really jealous growing up that he got all this special attention, but it's jealous for a bad reason, right? It's jealous because he's going to face things that I'm very fortunate to never have to deal with myself personally. Um, so a lot of it's contingent on what your kids look like, um, the community that you live in, right? So I grew up in California and California has one of the largest mixed race populations in the country um, behind Hawaii, which is an island full of mixed people. But since I've left California, I've realized how few interracial couples there are in other states and other regions. And that isolation alone can increase that tokenization, right, for biracial kids growing up. So it's, um, yeah, a lot to study, a lot of places to go. But, you know, I'd say just give your godsons and kids and stuff high fives and that positive identity development is going to go a long way. All right. <laughs> high fives. All right. <laughs> Um, this was really awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was a great interview. Um, is, are there pla is there a place where people can, you know, find you, find more about your work, website, social media, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm on Twitter. I'm at Sarah E. Gaither, if anyone want to follow me on Twitter. We also have a lab Facebook page. So I run the Duke Identity and Diversity Lab. So we're always posting new podcast coverage, media coverage, publications, announcements about our lab group, lab group there. And we also have a website. So if you wanted to Google Duke Identity and Diversity Lab, we post all of our published work there for free for everyone to access to. Oh, nice. Oh, that is so awesome. Like, y'all better jump on it because if you want to pay for these articles individually, <laughs> they sometimes cost a lot of yeah, money. Um, I'm getting memberships. They're behind these expensive firewalls. My mom's always like, I can't read your work. I'm your mother. Why can't I read it? Uh, <laughs> struggle. That's funny. Yeah, they do make it tough. Yeah, the struggle <laughs> is real. But, um... Thank you so yeah, much. We, uh, we, we really enjoy having you on. This was Yeah, really thanks awesome. so much for having me. Yes. All right, Daph, what, what a really good interview, wouldn't you say? Thank you, Dr. Gaithers. Yeah, like, so I enjoyed it because, uh, well, she talked about me search, mm -hmm. but it's so awesome that she can talk about this using methods uh, using research that is very credible, but she can also talk about it from a very personal experience. Mm -hmm. I also appreciated what she had to say about how like uh, Rachel Dolezal has like made her life a little bit more difficult. Like, mm -hmm. come on, girl, don't be out here perping identities that you don't have because the people who have those identities are then called into question. So I thought yeah. that was interesting. Yeah, no, that was good. I mean, it was right. I mean, Rachel Dolezal is, you know, a fully white woman, but tries to do this whole play both, and uh, you know, sides kind of thing. And um, as as Dr. Gaithers was saying, you know, uh, it's already like the biracial experience is already 
has their they already have their own challenges and difficulties. And now you're just adding on that where it's like kind of almost trying to delegitimize their experience. Now, when somebody is like really Mm -hmm. biracial, it's like, do we believe you or no? You just trying to be black or like, no, they really Mm -hmm. are black, you know, and they Mm -hmm. probably have parents that are black and they understand the black experience and brothers or siblings who look black or whatever it is. Um, So that's. Yeah, that, that was good, her perspective on that. And I really appreciate her just being open and candid and, you know, talking about her research, but also talking about how her life experiences influence her research. Um, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes, and like you said, sometimes in academia, people try to be like, oh, you got to be super objective. Her research is still very objective if you, when you read the articles. It's experimental designs. She's not a part of it. Like she said, having the Confederates and the students and all that kind of stuff. Um, but all of us have are passionate about our research because usually it stems from something that we are personally interested in. So mm-hmm. I don't know why people would hold that against her if they do at all. Well, the thing is, you cannot build a whole career off of something that you are not interested in. That, like, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dang. Man, I used to just be mad taking classes that I didn't care about, you know, trying to trying to do some whole research agenda and write papers and do all that whole process for something you ain't passionate about. That, that ain't going to work. So that's what it should be. So, so you know how you asked about Obama? You know who we should have asked about? Who? Meghan Markle. Yeah, we should have. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't think about it at first because you know, she talked about like, um, you know, people want to claim like the winning team. Like, so we in our in our another episode, we talked about how like we've watched Suits. We knew who Meghan Markle was. We knew she was biracial, mm-hmm. you know, before this. But as soon as she got with the prince, all of a sudden, like, I don't know. I saw a lot of black women. I was like, yes, girl, black girl magic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Ain't that the truth? I mean, that goes that speaks to exactly what she was talking about when Obama had won. And, you know, people were like, mm, whatever. But after he won, just because he won, everybody was claiming, you know, white people were claiming him, black people were claiming him. And that calls for his broader sense of appeal. I think that's the same kind of thing that happened with Meghan Merkel is like when she was winning, quote unquote, you know, I guess just getting (laughs) married, (laughs) getting married. Every white people are like, oh, yes. And black people are like, oh, yes. And again, this general appeal, you know, I've always I didn't I know her from the show Suits, but I didn't view her as this like, I don't know, this kind of iconic figure of what she came to be because of this marriage, you know. Um, mm-hmm. but I feel like, you know, I think that played a role Just everybody's like, yeah, it's a princess and all this kind of stuff. But, but yeah, that was really, we, I'm, yeah, we should have be able to get those questions and that would have been interesting to hear her take too. But she, yeah. you know, she, she, but she alluded, you know, to different factors about it in our conversation. Mm. Um, I, I also, I like the point that she made in the end about like letting people identify how they want to identify um, I get into a lot of little online squabbles on message boards. Um, and this topic actually comes up a lot in terms of like, what, what are biracial people? And there are a lot of people that's like, you look black, I'ma call you black, or you look this, I'ma call you this. And I, I just believe in like, dude, or, or person, just let people identify how they choose. You know what I'm saying? You don't know people's, you know, internal identities or their processes. Like, why does it matter so much to you what they are choosing? Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't matter. Um, and, you know, I, I've always just been like, I'm, I'm just accepting. Like, when I feel like somebody is just looks black or whatever, you know, I'm just, I just treat them as, as black, you know, I'm not like, Oh, you're not a hundred percent black. Um, so you don't really understand and stuff like that. I never do that. You know, um, a lot of times I've actually been with even these past few years being like Purdue and stuff like that. It was, I was actually shocked to find out that people were biracial. <laughs> you know, my wife would be like, you didn't know she was biracial. I'd be like, no, nah, I just thought she was just a light-skinned black person. <laughs> light-skinned, yeah, you know, and that's true. Like, did, you gotta ask these things, because I know growing up in the South, I remember, like, we used to play with these kids, and I just thought they were light-skinned. And then when I saw their mom, I was like, oh, okay. But... I don't know. In the South, a lot of biracial people, you know, just go by black. I don't know if that's by choice or just because like people will be like, you black. Uh, but yeah, I accept you. If you, I accept you as black, but I think I've been trying to be more cognizant of the fact that people are claiming their biracial yeah. identity. Like, have you seen that documentary 
it was like a YouTube documentary that was like, I'm biracial, not black, damn it. No, I, see. I think I heard of it, but I don't think I watched it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the name of it. I'm like, okay, we get it. <laughs> so I just been trying to be like more cognizant of the fact that like some people who are biracial might not go exclusively as black. They want to make sure that like both of their identities or all of their identities are represented in what they claim. So I, I kind of try to think about it like that mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I remember like one, one time, um, and I like just trying to think of like the experiences of biracial people um, and why I think it's important to really highlight, cause they do go through some different things in their own experiences. Right. Just trying to navigate the world. And I remember it was, it got real awkward one time. It was like this girl, she was biracial, but she looked white. Uh, so we didn't really know, but she was just hanging with us, la, la, la. And I think we were like, it was like a, a hip hop song on or something like that. And it was like the N word. And it's so like, she was singing along the lyrics and she was dropping the N-bombs and everybody was like, stop the record. <laughs> like, bro, like they literally like stopped playing the record. And then people was really about to go in. She was like, what? She was looking at us like we was crazy. And everybody's looking at her like she was crazy. And then, um, and then she was like, oh, she's like, nah. She's like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm black, right? I'm biracial, la, la, la. And everybody was like, oh, okay, okay. And then I started <laughs> playing the music again. But it was like, oh, it got kind of awkward at first because it was like, yo, you know, you can't like culturally and these expectations and the norms, like she, she was used to it, you know, but I don't think we didn't perceive her as black. She just looked white. And so it was like a little awkward interaction. But then once she said, oh, I'm black, you know, I'm biracial, everybody was like, ah, okay. And okay. The part, party, cool. party kept yeah. going. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. I can imagine how awkward that got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was awkward, but then it, it eased that. It was cool afterwards. But yeah, so I mean, yeah, it was good. I mean, I think it's like even like the, the when I was sharing with with Doctor Gaithers and like just what I'm probably gonna experience with my family and my brothers and whoever else you know experiencing biracial children and just trying to just get a better understanding of you know what it's like or, or how mm-hmm. to approach these situations. Cause you know, people that know me know I'm super pro black and, you know, I'm ready to have my kids grow up that way and be all black and blacked out, everything black. Uh, but then when my nieces and yeah. nephews come over, I mean, it's going to continue, but I want to be cognizant of like what their experiences are and, and how to approach it. But they will definitely. And making sure they don't feel uncomfortable, like making sure that, because you are so pro black, they don't have the feeling where like, oh, my uncle think I'm not black enough or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I'll, I'll accept them as black and whatever, but I don't want it to be like, I don't want them to feel less than right because, and they whatever. It's just a weird situation. We're all trying to figure out, um, but yeah. So it's cool, man. Yeah. It was a good conversation. And I'm glad she she hopped on to mm-hmm. talk to us. And we are definitely going to link. Um, you know, it is so awesome when academics make their stuff ex- accessible to the public. So we're definitely going to be linking the websites and, and things of that nature so you can read more about this work. And I know for any college students that are like listening, you know, and potentially wants to get into research, like read this stuff potentially figure out how you can get into somebody's lab. Uh, Because like I mentioned, I have a friend who also did some research or she was a lab um, manager at a UCA, UCLA lab. She did. I don't know if she even had a bunch of experience in undergrad, but that like set her on her trajectory. And now, you know, she's about to graduate with a PhD uh, from Harvard. So, yeah. Nice. Nice. So yeah, we'll definitely include those links um, but yeah, once again, thank you, Dr. Gaithers, for taking the time to come speak with us about this very popular, important topic um, and paving the way for your research. Uh, it's much needed and continue this discussion. We'll continue to follow your work for all of our listeners. As always, um, follow us on social media at BHD Podcast, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, email us, BHD Podcast at gmail.com. <clears throat> Um, go to our website, www.blackandhighlydangerous.com to keep up with all our latest episodes and the content and everything that we post. Uh, review, rate us. If you like what you heard, if you like what we're doing, all we're asking you to do is one simple thing that's free and probably take 10 seconds is just to review and rate us on um, iTunes if you can. And then share us with your friends, your families, and your enemies. <laughs> um, and as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. 
If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.